got questions, we've got answers, and we have the man to answer them, Jeffrey Levine from Buckingham Wealth Partners. Jeffrey, welcome back to another episode of Pass the Hammer. Hey, Bob. Good to be back with you today. So I received in my inbox this morning a question from a reader. It goes like this. I've heard mixed opinions about the amount of umbrella insurance I should carry. How much should I have, and does it make sense to have trust in place to protect my assets as well? Okay, uh, this is another one of those facts and circumstances questions. Love them. They're, they're almost, almost all the questions. They're so good because there's just no right or wrong answer. You know, it is right for you, wrong for others. So in this particular case, let's start with um, the umbrella insurance portion, and then we can get to trust, et cetera. So I think the first element of umbrella insurance, how much should you have? A little bit depends upon, you know, what do you do that's risky or what are the risk elements in your life? Do you have a, a child who has just started driving? Uh, do you boat? Do you jet ski? You know, like other sorts of things where there is an increased level of liability that, you know, could happen. And, and the second part of that is how much you got to protect and how much of that is really important to protect. In other words, you know, I'm going to go give two extremes here. You know, if you have uh, $10 of savings in the bank. Do you need umbrella insurance? Probably not. Because if someone sues you and gets your $10, ah, it's your $10. It's important. It's the only $10 you have, but it's not worth insuring. Let's just put it that way. Let's go the other extreme. You have $100 million of assets, $100 million just sitting in the bank. You just won the lottery. Do you need to insure all $100 million? Probably not. You could insure $20 million. And if for whatever reason you were sued for a hundred million, you know, could you live on 20 million uh, based on the umbrella covered? You, you probably, you, you could, you could squeeze by and make do, right? Like, so it, it becomes a matter in some cases of just simply, what do I want to protect? But there are other situations where it's, it's, it's a lot more, uh, it's a lot more definitive, at least how much you should consider covering. For instance, if you're in kind of that middle area where you need your savings to enjoy the lifestyle, lifestyle that you want, uh, whether it be now or in retirement, uh, you, you should be very cognizant that, you know, someone could sue you and take away those assets. And it's important to realize that, you know, having $1 million of assets and $1 million of insurance doesn't mean you're fully protected because someone can sue you and they could get awarded a judgment of $3 million, in which case, one million dollars comes from your insurance. The other million dollars comes from your stuff and you still have nothing. So it's, it's a matter of how much protection uh, you feel that you want. And look, I mean, you get into a car accident. It could be millions and millions and millions of dollars just in that, depending upon who you hit, how young they are, how old they were, what their earnings potential would have been. These are all the factors that can go into what the cost of a settlement is. So, I mean, obviously for someone, uh, uh, typically someone might have say a million dollar umbrella policy, the average American, uh, the cost to add another million or two million is n marginal, is it not? It, it really is. And, and so this is one of those insurances where a lot of times you just say like, just if you're not sure, go to the higher amount, right? Because sometimes it's like a hundred dollars or $200 for an additional million dollars of coverage for the year. So, you know, like for me, I, you know, I tend to go and buy coffee almost on a daily basis. If I don't buy it one day in the month or two days in the month, I could pay for another million dollars of umbrella coverage. Like if it, if it got to the point where I had to decide between the two, then I would choose the umbrella coverage because that's much more meaningful than those two extra cups of coffee. And I hate to do that because, uh, you know, too often we go back to this coffee thing, like don't spend money on coffee, no, spend money on whatever you want, as long as you can meet your other expenses that are key. Uh, but here I, I would say that if you're, you know, like, do I get two or three? Well, for an extra like 12, 15, $20 a month, go to the 3 million, protect yourself, give yourself a little bit more peace of mind. And look, hopefully it's a giant waste of money. The best thing I could ever hope for you is that your umbrella coverage would be a giant waste of money because it means you aren't sued, no one got hurt, all these types of things. So let's hope it proves to be a big waste of money, as does all your insurance, right? I hope you never use your term insurance because it means you didn't die young. I hope you don't use your house insurance so nothing happens to your house. Same thing here. But, you know, you know what happens. And so having coverage in place uh, can make sense. Now, in terms of the second question, Bob, I know there was a second question. Do you want to refresh our, our memory here what that was? Yeah, I, I think the reader was getting at the point that a trust would protect their assets as much as perhaps a, an umbrella policy. 
Sure. So that could be used. We could look at a trust. And I think the first thing when we're looking at a trust is uh, what assets do you have that maybe are protected already? Like a trust adds complexity and cost to a situation. So if you don't need it, oftentimes it's better to avoid it in the first place, right? So uh, there are two elements here. First, you may have a lot of your assets protected already. Many states fully protect IRAs, Roth IRAs, et cetera, uh, from creditor situations. At a federal level, your 401k, uh, provided it's not a solo 401k, et cetera, would be a creditor protected under the federal ERISA law. So that generally can't be touched. Your house in a lot of states is creditor protected under homestead laws. So that can't be touched. So we might be talking about your bank and brokerage assets that are in your name or a joint account. And, you know, an irrevocable trust can be a, a good tool to, uh, you know, to use here. But depending upon the type of trust that A, will add cost in the form of you got to create the trust, you've got to maintain the trust, you have to file annual tax returns for the trust, income earned by the trust, depending upon how it's set up, could be subject to trust tax rates. And um, in, a, in some states, you can't put money into a trust that is protected from creditors that you can get to also. You might be able to create an irrevocable trust and it's safe from your creditors, but now it's also safe from you, which kind of uh, may not be the old optimal result here. Now, there are some things called self-settled trusts and uh, these are becoming a little bit more common in certain states. But again, it's about what's the most important thing for you and how to what extreme do you need to go. I would say most people that I meet with would benefit from having, if they don't already, umbrella coverage. Most people I meet with probably don't need trust during their lifetime just for the sake of creditor protection. All right. Jeffrey, once again, nailed it. Uh, much appreciated. I'm sure the uh, reader appreciates it as well. Well, thank you. Uh, I hope so. And, and if you'd like us to take a crack at, uh, at your uh, question, go ahead and email us at askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. Again, that's askthehammer at buckinghamgroup.com. And we look forward to answering your questions here real soon. Yeah.